That's very fine of you. Thank you. I say this, God bless you all, and thank you so much. I hope to be back at Phoenix again right away. Now, let us bow our heads for prayer. Father God, we are so happy tonight to know that this group of people love us, and we love them, and all together we love you, and it's because of your love that we love one another. And may this love be undying love and never cease. Bless them, Father. Give to them the best that there is in the kingdom. And someday when life is all finished for us, everyone, may we gather at your house and there eat at your welcome table. Live together forever. Until then, keep us healthy, happy, serving you. Bless us tonight. Heal the sickness in our midst. And be thou merciful to us and forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just don't hardly know what to say tonight. My wife said to me this afternoon, I'd preach the heart till I was just about ready to my throat spitting blood from it and out of my chest you're hurting. She said, What makes you preach the heart? I said, Look, I've got the purchase of Christ before me. I said in the sight of God are greater than the blood of his own son. You're the purchase of his son's blood. You were bought with his blood. And I like to put every pain that there is within me because of the love of Christ and for you. And you're so good and kind to me. And I thank you, each one, for your attendance, even though maybe you might disagree with me on sickness, praying for the sick and different things, you've come right along anyhow. That shows there's real something about you. That I love. Phoenix has always had a spot in my heart. And wife and I are intending, if the Lord willing, one of these days, maybe this coming fall, to live right up around Phoenix here somewhere for this next winter, if the Lord willing. Thank you. Thank you. To the pastors, we're not coming in to start a church, not at all. We're coming in, while I'm in here, I'll go from church to church everywhere, visit everybody and pray for them. Thank you. Thank you. And I, would, I think Phoenix is beautiful. Once when I was a boy, I was here, and I lived up here on 16th and Henshaw Road. How Phoenix has grown since those days. I remember you used to take my horse down and water Salt River right behind on 16th and Henshaw, close to Brother Ballard's Tabernacle. And then it was so far in the wilderness, while the horse was getting a drink, I'd go in swimming. Uh, just think of his 16th and Henshaw about 25 years ago. Well, it's built up and I've got old. This is quite a difference. But I still can remember. I remember working out here. There might be somebody here tonight. Used to be out here near Wickingburg, a circle our ranch. I don't know whether you ever remembered or not. And you old timers here. I was out there. I remember the man's name was Dale. I worked for at the circle our ranch, right out between Glendale and, and Wickingburg. I remember we used to go either to Glendale or back to Wickingburg. And at that same time, I didn't know it, but one of my associates was preaching in Wickingburg at that time. He was in the ministry then. And he's just a little older than I. That's Garden Lindsay. And uh, he was there. I remember one time I'd taken a whole day's journey. And we had to leave early in the morning and drive to way late that night to get to Ajo. Horseboard Road, just like that. And I went out the other day to Glendale. It's just a smooth, slick highway right on through. I'd like to visit Ajo again. I hope to be in the valley here, if the Lord willing, as soon as possible. Our little children, we got a little boy. I was talking to him tonight. He's 22 months old now. 
You could just say, Dad, Mom, or Bum. That's all gone. <laughs> and so I, my little girl is six going into school, and my little other little girl is 11. I think that's right, honey, wherever she is, my wife. And I, she's around here somewhere. <laughs> She hides from me because she's afraid I'm going to make her stand up. <laughs> Talk about a bashful person. She is. And, um, but she's a, not only that, but she's a lovely person. I certainly would pray that every person, young person here, when you get married, that you're just as happy with your wife and you're happy together as Mrs. Branham and I are living together for the Lord Jesus, raising our children. And I love her, and I just, she loves me, and so we just love the Lord together. And we feel that Lord, the Lord put us together, and I hope we remain that way as long as life's in our bodies and live together in glory someday. I want to thank each one of you for your attendance. I want to thank this fine bunch of ministers here who cooperated. You can see their names, I think, on here somewhere. And how we appreciate that cooperation. You've been very kind. And I want to thank each one of the ushers. You've done a wonderful job. And for all the music, the lady here plays the music. And for every one of you. And then for the offerings that you gave me. Love offering. I didn't come for that thing. I wish you so I didn't even have take any. And we never let pressure be put on a meeting. I understand that all the debts were paid off and everything's fine and dandy. We thank you for doing that. It was your, your kindness. And the offering that you give me is a portion of living from your family. I know that. You're poor people. I wish I didn't have to take it. But I got three children. Home expenses runs me about $100 a day. Now, of course, that, don't sound, that sounds like a whole lot to me. But that would sound very little to Brother Roberts or Brother Allen or some of those brothers who have great big programs that have to have lots of money. And that's the reason I don't have to have much money. I'm not under any expense. I don't have television programs. I'm just not. I guess the Lord never called me for that. I'm too illiterate, the first thing. I'm not nothing in business, and I don't believe I could take care of it. Like Brother Allen and Brother Roberts and many of those others who have those big programs. I guess Brother Roberts has to have around seven or eight thousand dollars a day to operate his expenses. Now, if I had all that on my mind, I'd I'd be worse than what I am now. <laughs> I, I I don't believe I could rest. But I I'm so glad I haven't got it on my mind. I can go to little bitty church, or I can, if the Lord wants me to. I preach to nearly many thousands at a time. 150,000, 200,000, and so forth. When I do that, the Lord always puts on somebody's heart to help sponsor me to go overseas. Then when he wants me to go down to a little, what we call Timbuktu, just a little place there where I preached a couple weeks ago in a church that had 30, 30 people. Brother needed help. I felt the Lord wanted me to go there, so I went. And that's it. See, I, I don't have to have very much, so it don't take very much to run me. So I'm so grateful to you helping. Now, to the best of my knowledge, I put every penny of it to the glory of God. And someday, friends, when we meet on a, in a better land, the God's land, where we'll never be old, we'll never be sick, we'll never pray for the sick anymore. All the old will change back young again. Won't that be wonderful? I hope to meet each one of you and sit down and shake your hands. Talk with you just a thousand years of peace, you see. It won't have no less time than we, than we did the first hour we entered. There'll be no time then. It'll all be eternity. And I pray that he who keeps the moon shining bright makes the stars pretty bright for traveling at night. I hope he'll watch over you and protect you till we meet at that time. God bless you. There was something I had on my mind. Yes, to thank the people for this auditorium, this arena here. I want to thank them if any of them is present, custodians and so forth. It's been mighty nice. This is about two or three times I've been in this place, and I certainly want to thank him. Coming in the door just a few moments ago, I was introduced to a minister 
had no limbs. I think diabetes caused him to lose his limbs some time ago. And he was in a little wheelchair to think, shake that man's hand. No limbs. And yet, when I was knelt down or stooped over and had a little prayer for him, he raised up his hands and praised God. Oh, my. How wonderful that is. The Lord bless that man. And now, remember me. How many will pray for me? <laughs> I'll be praying for you. Thank you, friends. God bless you, each one. I'll be praying for you. And I see some of my friends, the Indians, are sitting back here tonight. Are you all from the Apaches up there, the Apaches? I, I had a wonderful meeting up there the last time I was there. How many was up there to see that little Indian princess girl receive her sight? I believe her daddy was behind her. How the doctors and them went out there to examine him. We've always had a good time up there on the reservation, and I wanted to come this time. It's so hoarse, I know I couldn't speak outside. I see you understand English, don't you, lady? You tell the brethren up there for me. Will you do it for me now? Tell them that I didn't get to come because it's so hoarse and so tired. But if nothing else, I'll come down. I'll be down the valley pretty soon, the Lord willing. And I'll come up and have a good long meeting for you all up there. I pray that God will bless you. I know all the other people here. We all appreciate the Indian people, don't we, friends? Every one of us. It's their, it's their land that we're living in. Who is the American? The one that God put here himself and gave the land. The Indian. It's exactly right. Such wonderful faith. I remember the first night there. Brother Moore, we could say many things about that, Brother Dan. So thank you very much. God be with you now. Now I want to speak for you in the closing service just for a few moments. And we want to try to hold that prayer line just as long as I can tonight. That is, if we should call one. And I remember, if any time I can pray for you, call me up. If any time you want a prayer cloth, send it. Just send for it. I'll send it to you. And now, anything that I can do to help you, be a blessing to you, help you solve a problem, pray for you, let me know. Just write to me. Everything's free. You won't be wrote back and done or bill for anything or I have nothing to sell or nothing but just, I got love and I want to express that with you to the Lord Jesus. In the 17th chapter of the book of St. Matthew, beginning with the first verse, I wish to read a portion of this tonight for my closing thought to this revival. And while you're turning to it, if any other evangelist comes through, any of the brothers, Brother Roberts or uh, uh, Brother Hicks or Brother Allen, any of the rest of them comes to the land, when you meet them, greet them for me. Any of the ministers, the friends that maybe wasn't in the church today, I'll tell you what I think, unless something strangely happens tonight. The great thing that I was praying for God to do, I think I've seen it happen this afternoon. When around 100, 150 preachers come down here with their hands to God, that they'd settle a difference and not fuss anymore, that have fellowship with one another throughout the valley of Phoenix. I'd rather see that done than to see 5,000 souls come to Christ. If they'll stick to that and stay with that, it'll win more than 5,000 souls to Christ. If they'll just stay with it. One man can't do it. We've got to do it as one united brethren. We've got to do it together. And brother, as long as we're divided, we can never do it and please God. But I pray that that'll be the motive of each and every one. That all differences will be cleared up. Denominational differences have love one for the other. After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brothers, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was as white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good to be here. 
If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And for our text tonight, I want to use that last three words. Hear ye him. Now, Jesus, when he was here on earth, he didn't just go about uh, haphazardly. He had one thing to do. That was the will of God who sent him. And everywhere he went, everything he'd done had a meaning, had a purpose, had a, a plan, a foreordained plan of God, everything he did. And if we be the children of God, our life is in the hands of God who orders our footsteps, and the footsteps of the righteous is ordered of the Lord. Jesus never went places or did things unless it had a meaning. Many men down through the ages has read this same scripture, and it has inspired men through the ages. I might write you a letter, and you being my friend, you'd appreciate that letter. It isn't long till that letter doesn't have any meaning to it no more. It's gone. Maybe when you and I are finished on earth, then your children pick up that letter. Well, that's just a letter. My mother knew a preacher. My dad knew a preacher by the name of Branham. Well, they're gone. That's all. Because it just was designated to you, and the meaning of it was little, but not so with the Word of God. God's Word is for the whole human race, and it's eternal life. And every time you read it, there's a blessing in it. And every time that you, uh, every age when man read it, you just read something in it that you didn't read before. My word is just a flat word like a man. But that word has got life in it. It's the life of God lays in his word. And now, quickly, because I'm just going to speak a little bit, I want your attention. Now, Jesus takes us Peter, James, and John and went up into a high mountain. Now, sometimes get God gathers in great numbers of people. One time he gathered with 500 brethren. Again, he gathered with 12. Then he gathered with seven. Then with three. And he, get, he one time he met just with one. But he's promised that wherever two or three were gathered together, he would be in their midst. So we have that blessed assurance tonight to know that Christ is in this building. For he can't take his word back. He's got to stay with his word. Now, then they went up to the mountain, and three is a witness. In the Old Testament, under Jewish law, three testimonies was a witness. It could be confirmed by three testimonies. And now God taken Christ up to the mountain, not just for just to take him up there, but he went for a purpose. He was going to do something. And wherever Christ is around, he's there for a purpose. And if he's here tonight, he's here for a purpose. And when he was up there, watch, he'd taken Peter, James, and John. That's a witness. And they represent hope, faith, and charity. That's the three greatest witnesses we have in the Christian realms anyhow. Hope, faith, and charity. That's hope, faith, and love. Peter represented faith, James, hope, and John, charity. 
And then, did you notice while they were there, God fixed them to do something. He also had three from heaven to come down. Moses, Elias, and Jesus. There were three men of the earth to witness these events. There were three men from heaven to represent this as a witness this event. Now, watch close because I haven't got much voice. Three here on earth, Peter, James, John of the earth, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus of the heaven was to witness this event. Now, my brother theologians, I know the real meaning, the significance of this, was the coming of the Lord, the order of the coming. Moses and Elijah to appear, and then they looked back and saw Jesus only. But tonight, let's approach it for a few minutes under another way, because all the scriptures tie together. There's no loophole. That's the reason on some things that I might speak that might seem to seem strange to you. The angel of the Lord who speaks to me has never told me nothing but what was vindicated in this scripture. That's the reason I know it comes from God. See? Now, what I think God was doing here to the world also if we'll go back to the Old Testament just a, a, a little bit to pick up a little scripture to bring up here before we close it or Holy Spirit nail it down for us. In the Old Testament, there's patterns and types and shadows. All the Old Testament was kind of a shadow of the New Testament. And all that was in both Testaments is a shadow of this day. Now, we find out that in the Old Testament, when a child is born in a family, we find out that when he was born, he was a son. When this boy was born, he was a son by birth. But before we go to that, I'd like to speak something to you which many people have asked me. Why is John 14 wrote the way it is? It speaks like this, in my Father's house is many mentioned. Doesn't that seem strange? In my Father's house is many mentioned? How could a mention be in a little house? I must have been Moffat, I think it was, or some of the translators. I read it somewhere. It was more ridiculous than that. It said, in my father's apartment house is many apartments. <laughs> like you were going up there to rent an apartment. But in the original, it's written like this. In my father's kingdom is many palaces. But if you notice, the tradition of the Bible was brought down to England in the days of King James when the translators translated it. And what it was... The kingdom was a house, and the king was a father, and all of his delegates, his, his subjects in his domain, was his children. And so, making it so that people of England would understand, they translated it that way, in my father's house is many mansions. That meant in my father's kingdom is many Mentioned. Now, in the Bible time, that's where it was too. A man owned a great portion of land. And in this land, he had many hired servants. And they were, they were scattered abroad. And they were, then when this man, being a businessman running his farm, or his place, his stock, his business, when a boy was born, that boy was his son by birth. But yet that son did not fall heir to everything until he became of age and the father tested his character. Now in the Old Testament, when this baby boy was born, 
The father hired a tutor or a teacher, a razor. And to get this razor, tutor, many of you know the Galatian letters, Paul writing like to us, in this, picking out this tutor, the father picked out the best man that he could find for the job because he was certainly interested in his child. And any father's that way. That's a real father. That's just the love of a parent to a child. And this father went around and found the very best tutor that could raise his son and could bring up his son, educate his son, and teach his son to follow in his father's footsteps. And this tutor was to bring messages to the father how the child was progressing. Now all of that was a pipe of the church today. For when God brought us into his kingdom by the baptism of the Holy Spirit and become a child of God, God sent us the best tutor that there was in all heaven, the Holy Spirit. He is to nurture and to bring up and to reign and to teach the church. Brother, we need Holy Spirit teaching and tutoring. Now, now if this child did good, or if he did evil, think of what that tutor would do when he went in the presence of the father of the child and had to bring a report of disobedience. How that tutor must have blushed in the presence of the father. Your child is not doing good. Oh, he's sassy. He's snoopy. And he won't behave. He won't try to listen. He won't try to learn. He just doesn't care. Oh, how that teacher must feel to stand and talk to a parent like that. I often wonder, brother, sister, I hope this is not meant to hurt, but it's meant to put something before you. How do you think the Holy Spirit must be to go before God to bring our character as fussing, fighting, making differences, separating brotherhood? How do you think it must be when he has to go before the Father and say, your child didn't go to church tonight, the bell's rung, but he stayed home to look at television? How it must be to say your daughters that you gave the Holy Spirit, oh, they're dressing for him Molly, so they're making men on the street lust for them. How that must hurt the Holy Spirit to bring such a message as that. How it must be when he goes and says, Father of the child of God to us, how that they had meetings and they won't do this and won't do that. How I speak to their heart to move them up and nurture them by the word and they won't listen to it. How the Holy Spirit must feel. What it is then when the minister comes to town to preach the gospel in the fullness of the power of the resurrection. And the people walk the street and walk by and make fun of the word of God. And the Holy Spirit has to bring that before the Father and say, they even make fun. They won't listen. They are stiff-necked people. They're starchy. They're mad all. They won't listen. And if the Holy Spirit, here it is, if the Holy Spirit will teach anything, it'll be out of that Bible. Oh, he said, when the Holy Ghost has come, he will bring these things that I've taught to you to your memory and will show you things to come. That's the kind of tutor we got. 
the Holy Spirit to reveal and to bring the disparate book of the Father and reveal to you what God's plan is. Then when we step across them boundaries and turn away from it with a stiff neck, what does the Holy Spirit think when he stands before the Father? To bring our character to it. Can you see, brother, sister, why we're not progressing like we ought to? It's our own character that's tearing us down. Now, we're children. Don't forget that. When you're born again, you're a child of God. We're children, but disobedient children. Oh, I wish I had the voice and could stand here in the time we could lay on that for hours of the disobedience of the church to God and the Holy Spirit bringing that word back and forth. Now, but what if that child has done good? Oh, how the Holy Spirit likes to bring their character. How the teacher would like to come to the father and say, Are you the father of this child? I am. All right, I want to tell you. That little fellow is one of the smartest little chaps I've ever seen. Oh, even though he's youthful, he just, uh, well, he's just a chip off the old block. That's all. He loves you. He's just exactly like you. He's about your business. He stands just exactly firm on what you say. Well, he just, he's just like you. How that teacher likes to say that. What do you think that father thinks? Swear that he's just. That's the boy. Oh, God, I hope. I hope I can be obedient enough to the father and be pleased with what I did. I hope that you're obedient enough to be, uh, you know, please God. Then as that goes on and progresses, time goes on. After a bit, then when this child becomes of age, then if he's been an obedient, and if he is an obedient child, he'll never have nothing else but be a child. And brother, Pentecost is 50 years old in America this year. I wonder. 50 years old. When the child was disobedient, it was still a son. It was born the son. But the father could not put any confidence in it. So it never fell heir to any of the possession that the father had, but yet it was a son because he couldn't trust it. But if he could trust it, he took that child and set a certain day and put it out in a place in the street, put it on a shining robe, beautiful robe, had a big ceremony, and the father adopted that own child into his family. Or otherwise, for you teachers, it's the placing of the son that I'm talking of. That son was placed by ceremony into position, and after that ceremony was said, that boy's name on the check was just as good as the father's. He was positionally placed to a position. Now, I believe that the Pentecostal Church has all nine spiritual gifts operating in it, but it's so mixed up. If we could only get quietened down away from our differences and become one great united body, God would place those gifts exactly where they belong. Then you would see miracles done, signs and wonders done. These gifts, like speaking with tongues, how we misuse that. Just fly loose anytime. Did you realize that that's wrong? Certainly it is. But put it in its place and let it be used exactly the way God intended it to be. It'll bring down the power and blessings of God. Out of place, it'll cause confusion. Like Paul said, say not you all crazy here. So forth. Healing is a marvelous thing. But if it's misused, placed in the wrong position, 
then it becomes a reproach. All the other gifts are the same. And that's what through this week I've been trying to tell you, my dear friends. It is isn't I've been trying to be indifferent. It's the things that I know that these great things are not positionally placed where they should be placed. It's free to you. If everything was operating perfect and harmony with God, this great Pentecostal group would be one great big Pentecostal Church of the Living God. Right? But it's the way we misuse it. The gifts are here. But as I said the other morning, we hold so much on speaking in tongues and interpretation. Now watch. That's the last and the least of the gifts. The first gift was wisdom. The second gift was knowledge. And what good is it going to do to have knowledge if you haven't got wisdom to know how to take care of your knowledge? What good does it do to speak with tongues if you haven't got wisdom to know when and how to place it? Same thing with healing. But there are any other gifts. And that's the reason we won't listen. It's just... I ain't laying it on to the laity so much, I'm laying it on to the preachers. It's just so confused with their organizations. If you've got an organization, that's all right. I wish we had more organizations, and every church was its own organization. would be all right with me as long as the unity of brotherhood and fellowship could be amongst the people in one great big bubble of love. See where we miss it? Now, if we are obedient children, if we in the Methodist, in the Baptist, in the Oneness, in the United, in the Assembly, Church of God, Nazarene, Pilgrim Holiness, if we were obedient children, when our founders raised up they got a revelation on something to build an organization around it. That's all right. It's okay. If you would build your organization and end it with a comma, we believe this plus as much as what God can show us. But in trouble, we build an organization and end it with a period, this is it, and that's all of it. Then God can't work. See? And then in doing that, the devil comes around and he gives you false things. What we ought to do is big one big body of love all together. Every church in the difference, well, I've got nine brothers. There is the one who looks like me or it's not a preacher in a bunch. I've got a brother next to me, great, big, tall, blonde-headed, blue-eyed, fair-skinned. Well, he don't like the things I do. Our appetites are not the same, our desires are not the same, but his daddy is my daddy. So if a man disagrees with you, yet a Christian brother, what difference does that make? If we're real children, we'll be loving one another, taking up for one another, helping one another, standing together. If one of the brothers get out of line, then the whole group ought to go and say, now wait a minute, brother. See? Come here. See? That's what we ought to do. Now, then, then when that son was adopted or placed positionally into the, the, the kingdom, he was a co-heir. He was just as much authority as what the, his father had. He could bind, turn loose, do whatever he wished to, because he had already been recognized and adopted and positionally placed under the authority. Now, God never done anything, never asked the man to do anything that he didn't do himself. He pronounced death upon a man when he sinned. God come down and took the death of the man upon himself and died the death of the sinner man that he might redeem him back. That's the only way he could do it. God in spirit, he couldn't suffer God was made flesh in order to suffer, to take the penalty of sin upon himself. 
Now, when God was going to adopt his own son, he taken three witnesses of the earth, Peter, James, and John. He brought the three witnesses of heaven, and Jesus was transfigured before them. And there he stood out. Watch this ceremony. And he was overshadowed. And his rain was shining like the sun. He's placing his son, like in the Old Testament. And Peter got all excited. He's just like me and the rest of us. He said, Lord, you know it's good to be here. Here stands Moses, and here stands Elijah, and here's Jesus. He said, let's just build three tabernacles up here. Let's make three denominations. Let's have all those that wants to keep the Sabbath and don't eat meat and keep the law. Let's just build a tabernacle for Moses. Let him lead his group. And said, now, Moses represented the law. And by the law, no precious faith. You can't be saved by the law. The law is only a schoolmaster. It only pointed sin. The law could point out sin, but it didn't have the remedy for sin. Moses represented the law. Then what did Elijah represent? Elijah represented the justice of God. Elijah was the stern representation of God's justice. He had a revelation from God, a vision. One of them sat on a hill. Here the king sent fifty men. Raised up. And he said, If I be a man of God, let fire fall from heaven and consume you. Down come the fire. Justice of God. Transgression must die in the presence of it. The king said that just might have been a thunderbolt passed through. I set up another fifty. So when he came up on the hill of fifty, Elijah raised up and said, If I be a man of God, let fire come from heaven and consume you. And down come the fire and consume you another fifty. Justice. Oh, we don't want justice. Would you dare to say that you want justice? Would you dare to try to go to heaven on your own keeping of laws and legalistic things you'd do? If that was all right, Christ died in vain. The law is not a remedy. A law is the magnifying glass to show you sin. It's the one that can put you in prison. It's the law. But it has no redemption in it. Look where we're standing when when Peter spoke that. Let one keep the law and let one do this and one that. Oh, I'm so glad that there's somebody else to look to when we're standing in the realm of law and legal. Oh, by it we're all condemned and all flesh is condemned by the law. And we were all born in sin, shaped in iniquity, come to the world speaking lies. Without, a, without even a chance we don't have it, how could we stand the justice of God? But oh, my dear precious friend, turn your head and look this way. God said, sending there said, this is my beloved son. Yeah, he, him. <laughs> There's a remedy. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. So all the ransomed church of God be sin to say to sin no more. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. When this poor listening spirit upon life silent in the grave. Jesus represented God's love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Moses' is justice, or his uh, law, his magnifying glass, his body of 
officers that throw you in jail because you sin. Elijah represented the one who called fire on you while you're in jail. That's God's justice. Moses throws you in jail, and Elijah called the fire from heaven and burnt you up. But Jesus was the Redeemer. God's love for you. Oh, Christian, that's the gospel. That's the power of God. Yea, ye him. Moses cannot save you. He can. Moses cannot heal you. He can. Elijah and all of us can do anything for you. He can. Moses cannot raise you up on the grave. Neither can Elijah. But Jesus can. God said, hear ye him. He's the one. What we need today, brother and sister, is more real, genuine Christian love this place among believers. The world's are looking for something today. When your little wife told you she'd be your sweetheart and wife, she was looking for somebody to love her. And when you promised your husband he was looking for somebody when he'd come in tired and weary from working all day, some little wife would put her arms around him and kind of brush his hair back and tell him how much she loved him. That's what causes separation in families is the neglect of love. That's what causes the separation in churches, neglect of love. We got to have love. Some time ago, as you know, I'm a hunter. I went up to the North Woods. I usually hunt up there. And then here, I got acquainted with a man up there, which was a nice man, but a cruel-hearted fellow. He was a good hunter, a good tracker, but he was the brutalest guy I ever seen amongst wild animals. He would just shoot little old fawns just to see them fall. And that used to get all over me where I was a game warden. I'm still a conservationist. I don't believe in killing the little things. If the law says you can have one, that's all right. Abraham eat a calf. God eats a calf with him. That's all right. But if the law just requires one, take one. But Burke would just take about eight or ten just to be mean. Well, I would go on to him. I'd say, Bert, what makes you do that? Oh, he said, Billy, you're just chicken-hearted like the rest of the preachers. I said, Bert, it isn't chicken-hearted. It's a principle that's involved. Oh, he said, that's the way with you preachers. And one year when I went up there, he made himself a little old whistle. And it sounded just exactly like a little baby fawn crying for its mama. And he blowed it for me before he left the camp. And I said, Bert, you're not going to use that. Oh, he said, go on, get next to yourself, preacher. So we had hunted several hours and hadn't found nothing. We come to a little clearing spot, and he stooped down there by the snow, took out this little whistle to blow it. I stood right behind him looking at him, and he got out and got this little whistle, and he cried with it, made it sound like a little baby fawn squealing. And when he did, just across the way, a great big mother doe, that's the mother deer, raised up. Oh, I noticed Bert duck his head down. I seen her with those great big brown eyes. Oh, she was a beautiful animal. Those big ears, they're so pretty, sticking out like that, she's looking around. What was it? She was a mother. That's what she was. A baby was crying. She was a mother by her nature. She was a mother. The baby was crying. Where is it? She walked out, and when she came out of the bushes into the clear, I could see the big veins. 
wasn't over 30 or 40 yards and that bird was a dead shot. I seen him take the bolt on that rifle and pour it up a shell into the magazine, up into the barrel. Now I noticed him as he leveled those strong arms down that crosshair across the heart of that doe. Here she comes walking out, looking. She was a mother. She was watching every footstep. A baby somewhere was in trouble. I thought, oh, Bert, surely you're not going to shoot that deer. And I noticed him leveling that hand. I turned my head. I couldn't look at it. And I looked back, and I seen the mother deer had spotted him. When the click of the rifle went down, the boat pulled the shell in the barrel and locked it. The mother deer heard that. She turned her big head. She threw those ears pointed. She looked at the hunter. That cross hair laying across her heart. Just a few minutes and her heart would be blown plumb out of her. But did she notice it? No, sir. There was a baby in trouble. She moved on out slowly with those ears and eyes watching that hunter but looking for that baby. She couldn't help it. She was a mother. That was her nature. I thought, oh, don't do that. I was standing like this. I thought, God, please don't let him destroy that mother. He doesn't need that dear like that. And I was praying. I was listening any minute to be shot on the great blast of that 30 or 6 fire. But I noticed I didn't hear the gun go off. And when I turned to look, the rifle bear was going like this. He dropped the rifle on the ground and turned around, grabbed me by the hand. He said, Billy, I've had enough of it. I just can't do it. He said, I want to know about that Jesus that you know so much of in me. There, by the grace of God, that cruel-hearted hunter, after seeing that display of real, genuine love, it tore the heart out of the hunter. The love that the mother dear was displaying, she couldn't help that. She was a mother. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, when the people who belong to the church of the living God will display the real Christian love, it will conquer more sinners than all the other things you can put together. That's what we need. No matter what takes place, if you don't love the Lord Jesus, oh, God be merciful. Not long ago, a band just passed through the country in the Middle East 50 years ago called Ben McCurdy. He had a dream one night that he died and went up to heaven. And when he was there in the presence of God at the gate, he said that there was a, a man came out at the gate. And he said, who are you? He said, I am Daniel Curry. I'm an evangelist. I've come to possess my heavenly possession. He said, just a moment, Mr. Curry. The gatekeeper heard him when he said, Mr. Curry, I'm sorry. Your name is not on my books. Oh, he said, you must be mistaken. So I look again. said, no, Mr. Curry, your name's not here. Oh, he said, I won thousands of souls for Christ. I stood for Christ for years. Surely, surely my name's there. He said, I'm sorry, sir, that you'll have to depart from the gate. He said, unless you want to appeal your case. If you want to appeal your case to the great white throne, you may do it. Well, he said, I have no other choice. So he said, all right, you can appeal before the white throne. That's the law. And said, so, you see, Mark, he was going for hours just through space, he said in his dream. And after a while, he got lighter and lighter. He got slower and slower. 
until finally he stopped right in the midst of this big light. It was coming not from any certain spot. It was just all light, said shining thousands of times brighter than the sun. And when he stopped, he heard a voice speak from this light and said, Daniel Curry, when you were in the earth, did you break my laws? Did you ever tell a lie? He said, I thought I'd been an honest man. But said, in the presence of that light, I've seen a many things I told it wasn't right. And brother, sister, that'll be the same thing to you. You may seem all right here, but in the presence of that light. He said, Daniel Curry, did you ever steal? He said, I thought surely I was never stole. He said, just getting ready to say, no, Lord. And said, when I started to say it, before me come many little shady deals. In the presence of that light, it wasn't right. You may be able to bang over your conscience now, but in the presence of God's great white throne, under oh mercy, brother, I'm satisfied that none of us has even the faintest idea how pure and holy it will be. And he said, No, Lord. I, I, yes, I told lies. And he said, Daniel Curry, to come into my place, a man has to be perfect. In your lifetime, Daniel Curry, was you perfect? He said, no, Lord, I wasn't perfect. And said he was just waiting for that great black to say, depart from me then. And when he was just getting ready to hear that, said, seemed like every bone went out of joint and he couldn't stand any longer. Then said he heard the sweetest voice that he had ever heard in all of his life. It was sweeter than any mother's voice that ever called a child. And said when he turned, he saw the sweetest face he ever saw. There was no face of a mother could express such love and said it was the Lord Jesus. And he come and put his arms around him, and he said, Father, in, uh, that's true, Daniel Curry wasn't perfect in the earth. Daniel Curry did many mistakes and things that was wrong. But he said, Father, on earth Daniel Curry stood for me. Now here in heaven I'm going to stand for Daniel Curry. Take all that's against him and put it on my charge, other Brother, sister, that's the voice that I want to hear. I want to stand for Jesus tonight. That on that day, I know I'm in perfect, but I want him to say, Father, William Branham stood for me on earth. I'll stand for him here in heaven. While we think of it, friends, and bow our heads, I'm going to ask you to think it seriously. Who will stand for you that day? Will your pastor? Will your priest? Will your mother? Will your friend? There can be none other stand for you but Jesus. Won't you stand for him tonight while we think it over? Our Father... We thank Thee that Thou hast said, This is my beloved Son, and whom I am well pleased, are pleased to dwell in. The laws is past. All of the self-wills and self-sacrifices and so forth has faded away, but Jesus remaineth forever. And tonight there may be men and women here who has never made a stand for the Lord Jesus. Now you speak to their hearts, Father, while I pray. And I pray for everyone here that if they've never made a stand at the closing of this revival this night, that they'll make that one all-sufficient stand, convinced in their heart that Jesus is their Savior. We ask it in his name and with our heads bowed.
think of it. Who will stand for you, friend? If you die tonight, have you someone there to stand for you? And frankly, there's no one that can stand for you but Jesus. He is the only mediator between God and man. Will you just raise your hand to him tonight and say, Lord Jesus, I raise my hand to you. By this I mean to say I'll stand for you. And in heaven when I die, I want you to stand for me. Will you do that much for him? Raise your hand. God bless you. Oh, my. God bless you. All around, over the bottom floor here, there's many, many hands up. Up in the balcony to my right. Yes, I see your hands up in there. God bless you. Back over here in this corner, this way to the south. Yes, I see your hands. God does, surely. The balcony to the rear. Would you raise your hand and say, Lord God, I stand for you now. Put my name on your book that when my soul comes in your presence, in the presence of the white throne of God, stand for me, Lord. Will you do it? He that will receive me, I will in no wise cast him away. Welcome you to the left now, to my left. God bless you all along there. Raise your hand. That's a little thing to do. God bless you, little ladies. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you, sister. God bless you, brother. All along there, yes. I'll now stand for Jesus. I wonder now with your heads bowed, if you would do just a little more than that, I wonder if you'd just stand up to your feet for an example, for proof that you want Jesus to stand for you. And when you stand to your feet, then I'm going to have prayer for you while you're standing. I want to call you up to the altar. I just want you to stand where you are and say, I'll stand for him now. And I want him to stand for me that day. Stand up to your feet now for prayer. All around, balconies and everywhere. That's right. Just remain standing for prayer. Everyone raise your hand. Stand right to your feet now. Stand for the Lord Jesus. All those who did not raise your hand and wants to stand for the Lord Jesus, stand up. God bless you. That's right. Everywhere. No matter who's sitting by you, that's what you want to do. You want to stand right by the people that even criticize you so that you'll know, they'll know that you're standing for Jesus. Look all around, my, my, with your head bowed, everyone standing now that wants to make a stand for Christ tonight. I noticed from men well-dressed and women well-dressed, the man with plow clothes on, some with cowboy clothes, they're standing. They love the Lord, they're making a stand. Husband and wife standing here together, little children, young ladies, young men, all standing together. Now, our blessed Heavenly Father, by the fruits of the Spirit that went forth with the gentle love of the dove and spoke to these hearts, they're convinced that they could not stand in their own self-made will, but they have stood tonight for you. Thou hast said, He that will stand for me before man and not be ashamed, him will I stand far in the presence of God and not be ashamed. But if they're ashamed to stand for me on earth, I'll be ashamed to stand for them in heaven. But God, these tonight has raised to their feet. Let the recording angel put every name down, for they're standing for Jesus tonight, confessing their sin and accepting Him as their personal Savior. God put their names on the Lamb's book of life. They, we know it can never be blotted out. For God will keep Him in perfect peace whose heart stayed upon Him. And I pray that you'll bless them as I present them to you. In Jesus Christ's name, Amen. I want you to look and see all the standing around everywhere you with your eyes up. Now, when these people sit down, you give them the right hand of fellowship by shaking their hand. And you believe be seated, dear Christian. It just becomes Christian. Give that somebody near them, shake their hands and say, God bless you. God bless you. So glad to see you do this. You're a fellow citizen now of the kingdom of God. Now, immediately after the healing service, I'm going to ask each of you, 
when the minister shall take over, I want you to come up here and thank God and pray personally to thank God for what you have, what He has done for you. For it's by grace are you saved through faith, that not of works, by the law, lest any man should boast. How many love Him? Now let's put up our hands. Oh, I'll live for Him who died for me. I'll live for Him who died for me. bless you. Don't forget that now. Live for him who died for me. Now walk out with a real experience, not with just anything different, but a real born-again experience that you can display the love of Christ before a world that's sinful and indifferent, dying for a little bit of love. May the Lord bless you is my prayer. All right, prayer card B is your give out today. Let's start standing the people up for prayer. B number one, two, three, four, five. Bring your, will you raise your hands if you look around? B number one. Did you say B? Maybe you're one to a hundred or fifty to a hundred. One to a hundred. B number one. Raise your hand, will you? Oh, I'm sorry. Number two. Raise your hand quickly. B number two, number three. All right, two, three, four, five. Who's got five? B five. Raise your hand. Watch for me here, if you will, brother. All right, five, six, seven. Who has B number seven? Uh, look around. Does it? All right, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. None of them is your number, brother. None of them is your number. Check the man's card right down here and see if you go by. He kept looking at me so sincerely. Let's pray for these now while we're... Heavenly Father, bless these handkerchiefs as I send them out to the needy. In the name of Jesus Christ, may your Spirit move up on them. Grant it, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. For the glory of God, I ask it. Amen. Is that little jacket to be prayed over there, Brother Brown? All right, everybody be reverent. And we're going to pray. How many's never been in one of my meetings? Let's see your hand. Just, oh, there's quite a number. Well, Christian friends, it has been my motive always to try to get people to believe without even touching them. I want them to believe in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And I want them to accept Christ. Now, we believe that Christ died and rose again. You believe that? I believe the Bible teaches He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. You believe that? That if He is the same, He's got to be everything the same except the corporal body. Now, that body... When it comes, time shall be no more. How many knows that? Yeah, when Jesus comes in his literal body, but he come now in the form of the Holy Ghost. And he lives in his church. It, we said we are the branches and he's the vine. He just stands in us in spirit manner and feeds the gifts of the church. How many knows that? 
And he said, the things that I do shall you also. Did he say it? What did he do? He never claimed to be a healer. How many know that Jesus never claimed to be a healer? Right? Jesus said, it's not me that doeth the works. It's my Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. He said, I can do nothing except my Father shows me first. How many know that? Right? Passed right through a pool where there's thousands of people lame, blind, halt, and withered. Never touched a one of them. What if he'd done that in Phoenix tonight? He'd be criticized. He was then. He found a man laying on a little pallet. And he said, Well, thou be made whole. He said, I have no one put me in the water. He could walk. He wasn't crippled. Nor blind. He had some kind of a trouble, maybe a prostrate trouble or tuberculosis. He was retarded. He had it 38 years. Wasn't going to kill him. So he said, I have no one to put me in the water. When I'm coming, somebody else steps down ahead of me. He said, take up your bed and go to your house. Watch, he's looking around there until he found that man. Now the Jews question him. And he said, Billy, Billy, I say unto you, St. John 5, 19. Billy, Billy, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself but what he sees the Father doing. Is that what he said? St. John 5, 19, look in your Bible. Jesus never performed one miracle without God showing him first what to do. Or he told something wasn't right and then he wasn't God. Verily, verily, that's absolutely, absolutely, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. The Father worketh, and the Son worketh the other two. That's right. I, we want to believe. We want to have faith. We want to believe that God will grant these things to us. And if he will come and present his life here to us again, just the way he did it when we sure on earth, how many will accept it then and say, I believe it? Now, what is it? Of course, you've been here with me for two weeks now. I don't claim to be a preacher. I mean what I mean, a theologian preacher. I just love to talk about the Lord. But my gift is seeing vision. There's nothing nobody laid hands on me for it. I don't believe you do that. Gifts and callings are without repentance. When I was born, just a baby, not over three minutes old, that light stood over where I was. My people are Catholic, you know that. I come from a Catholic family, Irish. Both mother and father. My mother, was, the blood was broke there. My mother is almost a half Cherokee Indian. That's right. If you'd see my mother walk across this platform, you wouldn't know her from an Indian. That's exactly right. She shows that anyone who knows her knows that's true. But her, her mother was an Indian. Her father was Irish. And they come from a Catholic family. But my father and mother didn't go to any church at all. But when I was born up there in that little mountain cabin, they pushed. They didn't have a window like you got here, nice glass windows, just an old door like they pushed it back. At five o'clock in the morning, and that light circled in and stood over where I was at. Brother, I know he's God. I'll make my mistakes. There's nothing to me. I couldn't do nothing. You know that. But I've certainly told the truth. And God has vindicated to the millions that is truth. And now the scientific record shows this truth because he took pictures of it in the United States and foreign countries and took it before the examiners and everything. And they say a supernatural light become natural and struck the lens. Amen. That's science. It's in Washington, D.C. We got the picture up here with George J. Lacey, the head of the FBI, and fa uh, fingerprinting and doc documents. That's right. The scientific world knows I've told the truth. The church knows I've told the truth. God knows I've told the truth. Now, if you'll believe me, then you will have what you ask for. If you can believe that Jesus died and rose again and died for your sins and sickness, accept it just on the basis that he did it, you can have whatever you ask for. God will give it to you. May the Lord bless you now while I turn to the audience, or to the sick line. It's not necessary for you to be here. That has nothing to do with it. You just look out. How many don't have prayer because he wants to be healed? Let's see your hand. All right? You just look and believe. Have faith. See if God don't call you. As the woman touched his garment, she went off and sat down. And when she did, Jesus said, Who touched me? 
There's Peter said, boy, everybody's touching you. He said, but virtue went from me. I got weak. He looked around till he found that woman that touched him, and he told her. She had a blood issue. Her faith had saved her. Jesus never touched her. She touched him. See what I mean? When Jesus did anything, the Father showed him what to do. But the people could touch him and draw remunerations by their faith on who he was. So you do the same thing. Or he is the same tonight and can do the same. The Lord bless you. All right. Be an usher. That's mighty nice, sir. I suppose between the two of us, we've never met before. I guess we're strangers to each other. You shook hands with me one time. I mean, I don't know you. But there's someone here who does know you. Besides your friends or who, your associates, your people or whoever's here with you, or what more, your church. There's one who knows you, that's Christ. And if Jesus is the same, I'm saying this for the audience that hasn't been here before. There was a man came to him one time, and he knew where that man was from. And he told him he was a believer, a Christian. Said it was a guy by the name of Philip went and got a man named Nathaniel. Jesus told him he was a believer, and he, he couldn't understand that because he told him he was a Christian. A believer, what we call a Christian today. And he said, When did you know me, Rabbi? He said, Before Philip called you, when he was around the fig tree there, I saw you. He recognized that to be the Son of God. Now, if he's raised from the dead, He's obligated to his word to do the same thing. Is that right, audience? Now, here's a man. Anybody want to take my place? You're welcome. I don't know the man. He knows I don't know him, and God knows I don't know him. Now, if the man is sick, I couldn't heal him. I had nothing to heal him with. But I'm trying to tell him that Healing comes by God. God alone does the healing. Doctors don't heal. They set bones and remove tumors. And, but God does the healing because healing is creation. Developing cells. So man can't do that. If he could, he could build a man. He only keeps the place clean with disinfects, keeps the germs out of it, while God knits it together and builds the tissues back. Healing is alone with God. So if any man tells you he's a healer, he's not telling the truth. Let him be whoever he may be, preacher or doctor. There's no healer but God. I'll admit the doctors are wonderful. They're God's servants. Some of them are staunch Christians. Some of them are not. We find the same thing amongst preachers. I find more believing doctors than I do believing preachers on divine healing. Doctors, many times, what doctors come to my home, sit there in a room, ask prayer. Great doctors of the nation. Certainly, they believe. Now, this man and I were probably maybe born many miles apart. I suppose I'm a little older than he is, but we... Here we are meeting for our first time face to face this way. And him knowing and witnesses himself, I don't have one idea what he's standing there for. He's just a man. Now, if God will reveal to me what the man's here for, or something he's done, or something or another that he knows that I know nothing about, would you believe? You believe that God gives it to you? Now, see, God don't have any voice on earth but ours. How many knows that? No hands but ours. We are the branches. He's the vine, and He just energizes us. And we bear the fruit, the vine, or the branch. Now that we are strangers and do not know each other, but if God will let me know what you're praying for, now you just speak to God about that then you're going to believe that God will give you what you ask for.
My brother, I see the man going way, way from me. He's really not from Phoenix. He's in a country different from this country. I believe it looks to me like Montana. Up in the range country. And he's seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and that's what he wants me to lay hands on him for. And besides that, he's praying for somebody else. It's a man. And he's a relative to you. He's a relative to you by marriage. He's your brother-in-law, I believe. And he's got a skin condition that you want me to pray for. That thus saith the Lord. You believe now? Amen. You believe all of you? Amen. Then, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll honor the faith of this people and give to them that what they have need of. Bless this man for whatever he needs in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. God bless you, my brother. Receive what you ask for. Find it that way. Now, that's more weakening than all the preaching I've done this week. Mm. Now, here is a woman. Here's a beautiful picture of the Bible again. Here's a colored woman. The white man. There was a Samaritan talking to Jesus, a woman. And he said to the woman, go get me a drink or bring me a drink. She said, you Jews have no dealings with we Samaritans. And it's not customary for you, a Jew, to ask the Samaritan such. Jesus said, but if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a drink. He let her know that there's no difference in the color of people. Black, white, brown, yellow, whatever it may be, they're all God's children from one tree, Adam. Now here's a colored woman and myself. Another picture of the Bible. I don't know the woman, never seen her in my life. We're total strangers. Is that right, ladies? But you have a right to the tree of life. And you know, one time when Jesus was going up the mountain, dragging that old rugged cross, dragging out this bloody footprint, some of your people picked it up and helped him pack it on. You know that. He knows it too. Now if the Lord Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman, told her where her trouble was. And she said as soon as he told her, as she told him, that she didn't understand how this was, but she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. She said, Now we know when Messiah cometh, he'll do these things, do all things. But she couldn't understand who he was, so she thought he was a prophet. So that was the sign of the Messiah. To the Jew, that was the sign of the Messiah to the Samaritan. Is that right? Well, would it be the same Jesus that's raised from the dead? Wouldn't that, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, wouldn't that be the sign of the Messiah to us? If he's the same? Now, may he grant it to the world. I don't say he will, but may he do it. The lady, for one thing, I see her, she's extremely nervous. And by being nervous, there has developed something wrong with her inward parts, which is in her stomach. She has ulcerated stomach. It's a peptic ulcer, which is caused from nervousness. Causes your food to sour and ferment, belching it up and so forth. And you've been in a hospital. Or two burglars. That's right. 
But you don't have to go now. It's finished. Your faith has made you well. God bless you, lady. And may His grace be sufficient to you. May the Lord add His blessing. Now His attitude here is His attitude to you. Be reverent. Don't doubt. Believe. Now here stands the little lady. I guess this is our first time meeting in life. I don't know you. As far as I know, you might know me, but I don't know you. We're strangers to each other. That's right. Raise up your hand. But God does know you. And if you, both of us being, you're a white woman, me a white man, you are a Christian. And you're suffering with a tremendous nervousness, which is a lot due to the time of life that you're living in. And you have just had a heart attack. And there's something about a, a hospital. You've been in a hospital. And you're something represented here. Bro- you know Brother Moore, by some means. It's very popular, you know. And you're formerly from the South, anyhow. That's exactly the truth. Now go home. It's over. God bless you. Your face, lady. Supposing us to be strangers to each other, sister. I don't know you and you don't know me. If that's true, would you just raise up your hand so people would know? You believe God will heal you that back trouble lady? Right there, the Spanish lady? That spinal trouble. You did have it, you don't have it now. Your faith has made you whole. I'm going to ask you, see her raise up? She's well now. What happened? Who did she touch? The Bible said that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. She touched something. You can touch the same thing. The Lord Jesus, have faith. Look, little lady. Believe. I don't know you, but God does know you. You are suffering with something that's on your right side, right under the ribs. It's a gallbladder with a liver, gallbladder, gallstones line. And you have, I believe you come from somewhere else too, here. And haven't you been in a hospital? But they didn't operate. And that was up in California, San Francisco. That's right. And now that they've got your spirit, you flew down here. You flew in a plane down here to be prayed for. You're supposed to go back in about a month. But I don't think you'll have to do it. I believe your faith has settled it, lady, and you'll be well. Oh, eternal God, bless this dear little woman and make her well through Jesus Christ. Amen. Be reverent. I don't know you, of course, lady, but God does know you. But if God will let me know what you're here praying for, will you believe him?
you do, if you do it, little fella, you can go home and be made well. In Christ's name. What did he touch? Blessed be the Lord Jesus Christ. You suffer nervously. And then in that it's caused a stomach condition. In that which causes a burning in your stomach. It's acid. Your nerves are such a fix that dumps out from the pancreas secretions of acid and it's burning your stomach. And you're praying for someone else, a paralyzed friend. That's right. To heal I can't, but a gift of God will make manifest every time. Come here. Oh, blessed Jesus, I bless this little woman in the name of Christ that she will receive that which she's asked for. Amen. You Spanish, but you can speak a little English. That's what I knew just a little bit. But you will be able now to understand it because the anointing is on you. I am your brother, but that which is on you is your Savior. You come for me to pray for you for a ruptured condition. And that's the navel is ruptured. You're from not from this city. You're from a city down south, Tucson. You got a little crippled girl down there you want me to pray for. Oh, Jesus, thou Son of God, be merciful and heal in Christ's name. Amen. Cancers, skin cancers. But do you believe that Christ will heal you? If thou canst believe, you can be made well. In Jesus Christ's name, may it be so. Amen. Have faith. You believe God heal you that sign of trouble? You do? All right, then you can have what you ask for. Just raise up your hand to God sitting on the end of the seat. All right, you can go home well. This lady had asthmatic trouble. That's right. Go home well, too. The Lord Jesus bless. It could cripple you, this arthritis. It puts you in a bed or in a wheelchair. But if you'll believe with all your heart, God can remove that acid from the blood and make you well. You believe it? Oh, blessed Jesus, I ask for the healing of my brother. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you now. Don't doubt. Go believe me. You're a healthy looking man. But the heart is something that doesn't show whether it's healthy or not. But God can heal that. Do you believe it? With all your heart? Then come here. Blessed Heavenly Father, I bless this man in Jesus' name for his healing. Amen. God bless you, sir. Believe now with all your heart. Dost thou believe the Son of God could heal you from the lady's trouble and the arthritis too and make you well? Do you believe that? Then the Bible said, These signs shall follow them that believe. You believe I believe him? Then these signs shall follow them. They lay hands on the sick, they'll recover. Then I ask for her healing in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Have faith. Wouldn't you like to eat again like you used to? That old stomach be well. You believe me to be God's prophet? Well, then go eat. In the name of the Lord Jesus. You nervous? 
the nervous trouble is what you think you're always crossing bridges before you get to it. Isn't that a screen and acid condition which make you have arthritis? That's right. You believe me to be God's prophet? Then go and receive your healing in the name of the Lord Jesus. Like to eat again? Like you used to? Go get you a nice hamburger and eat in the name of the Lord Jesus. Right. Right. Amen. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Do you believe it, lady? Look at that high blood pressure sitting there. Do you believe it? The line curved down there. You said that's what you're suffering with. Now, if you believe me to be God's prophet, put your hand over on the other lady sitting next to you. Now, you want to go to those turquoise things, lady? Be made well? Raise your hand up if you do. All right, you can have what you ask for. Do you believe? All right, lady. Look here just a minute. Do you believe me to be his servant with all your heart? I could not heal you, for I have nothing to heal with. But he whose presence you're in can heal you. You're suffering with the trouble, nervousness, and you got a spine that bothers you, which is a split vertebrae. Also, you have hemorrhoids. That's true. And besides that. You want me to pray for somebody else. That's your daughter. She has kidney trouble. She lives in California. And she's unsaved. And you've got a broke up home. That's exactly right. You believe? Then go and receive what you ask for in Jesus Christ's name. You believe? Oh, Lord, help our unbelief. This is a crucial moment. I love you with Christian love. I've told you the truth by God's Word, and God has vindicated that it is the truth. Now, here's perfectly the truth. Jesus Christ has healed every one of you. You're everyone here if you can believe it. What more will have to be done? Do you believe it? Stand up on your feet and accept it and be made well in the name of the Lord Jesus.